Coming up on this episode of Concussion Game Plan. Helps to hear from somebody that has gone through it themselves and just kind of have that guidance, you know, know that you're not alone. You're not the only person going through it. Hey everyone, it's Dr. Chris Nowinski, co-founder and CEO of the Concussion Legacy Foundation. Welcome to episode five of CLF's Concussion Game Plan podcast. This episode, we're digging into the cognitive symptoms of concussion, such as issues with memory, focus, concentration, and speech. We brought in Dr. Dan Danjavar to explain why those symptoms happen and how they are treated. Former high school and college football player Isaiah Osborne will also join us for today's episode. Isaiah speaks candidly about the darkest days of his concussion recovery and how he made it through. Here on Concussion Game Plan, we want to give you the information you need to set yourself up for complete recovery, but also to prepare you and your loved ones for the challenges you may face. Let's get to it. So cognitive symptoms really comprise everything that your your brain is responsible for in terms of how you think, what you remember, whether you're you're able to pay attention and concentrate. And uh, after a concussion, cognitive symptoms are unfortunately some of the most common uh, symptoms that can occur. Dr. Dan Danchvar is a doctor at Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital in Boston and a faculty member at Harvard Medical School. His own experiences playing sports inspired him to specialize in neuroscience. As a neuroscientist at MIT, I was fascinated by how the brain is this remarkable reverse engineering problem. And as a wrestler in high school and in college, and as a football player in high school, I had my fair share of hits to the head. So studying the long-term effects of repetitive head impacts and traumatic brain injury has allowed me to combine these interests in a way that uh, helps me provide answers for my patients in the clinic. Dr. Danchevar sees patients immediately after they've suffered a traumatic brain injury and follows them through their recovery process. He walks us through the common cognitive symptoms after concussion and explains why they happen, starting with memory issues. Problems with memory are related to the area of the brain in the frontal lobe. And those uh, problems can occur because a concussion is an electrochemical problem with signaling between different parts of the brain. And so the disruption in the cells as they try to communicate with one another actually ends up making it more difficult for you to do tasks that you normally would be able to do. You know, I'd be having a conversation with people just like we're having now. And... I'd be forgetting, you know, what, what am I talking about as I'm talking about it? And that, that's really scary. It's really scary. You know, I'd be at work, boss would be talking to me, ask me a question. I'd start to answer it. All of a sudden, I forget what the question was and where I was going with my answer. You know, at that point, I'm kind of just rambling on and on, trying to get back on track. And you never quite get there. That, that memory or that, um, that thought is gone. And it's like literally just went into a black hole and you can't find it. And now they're looking at you like, what are you talking about? Like, that had nothing to do with what I asked you. And, you know, what do you say? Like, I, I forgot what you said 10 seconds ago. I'm sorry. Like, that, that doesn't sound right. Isaiah Osborne was a force on the football field, dominating his high school competition in San Diego as a running back. He went on to play one year for the University of Sioux Falls in South Dakota before concussions forced him to step away from the game. He estimates he suffered several concussions, but his worst came after a hit during a game his junior year of high school. I actually scored a touchdown on this play. So, you know, everyone's all happy, excited. We scored. Uh, but the guy, after I crossed the goal line, I kind of let up. He still tackled me. And I pretty much fell all the way down and just my head straight went straight into the ground. Immediately, I remember my head was just an excruciating pain. But You know, I popped right up. I looked fine. I thought I was fine. And um, I think that's what throws a lot of people off, too, is that, you know, they think you have to be knocked out or, you know, need help to get up. And that's not always the case. But anyway, I headed to the sideline. Next drive, went back out there. I played running back, so I was running the ball. I got the ball on a handoff, and a guy hit me, like, barely. This is a routine hit. And I lost my balance, and I dropped the ball, like, hysterically. At this point, I was kind of like, I remember I was shaking and just feeling really weak. You know, I go to the sideline, you know, coach is mad, of course, because I just fumbled the ball. And I remember him yelling at me, but not really understanding what he was saying. You know, you fast forward to that weekend, because it was a Friday night that we played. I don't really remember anything happening that weekend. I probably slept the whole time. That's what I did a lot of times during football season. But come Monday, I woke up and 
you know, the sun was coming through the blinds like, you know, like normal when you wake up in the morning. And it felt like the sun was in the room. It was so ridiculously bright. Like, I'd never experienced this part in my life. This was new. And I get up, and then I notice every little sound, like, you know, me just walking, me moving the blanket. It was just, it sounded like a jet was in the room. It was super duper loud. I didn't connect it to a concussion or anything like that at all. It's just like, what the heck? I'm having a bad day. I get to school. I'm walking around all day with my head down. My eyes are bloodshot red. I'm having a hard time following any conversation. I'm not participating in class. And this continued for a few days. It was like Tuesday or Wednesday when a teacher actually called me outside and asked me about the game that we just played on Friday. She was like, you know, did you experience any big hits? Like what? I don't know why she was asking me all these questions. I'm like, you know, yeah, there was that one big hit on Friday that I took. But, you know, that was Friday. That was last week. You know, this is now. She told me, I think you have a concussion. And that's the first, my mind was blown. It's the first time I ever heard that. This is my 13th season playing football. And that's the first time I ever heard that. Didn't really know what that meant. I was like, okay, I'm still breathing. I'm still alive. Like, what's next? What Isaiah is about to describe here, unfortunately, happens far too often. Concussions are looked past and played through. I've been there as an athlete where you know you don't feel right, but the only thing on your mind is pushing through the pain and helping your team. We're taught to be tough, but over the last decade, we've learned how continuing to play through a concussion increases the risk for prolonged recovery and more serious problems such as second impact syndrome. Again, I thought I'd be fine within a couple of days. I wasn't really worried about it. And I really wasn't. And actually, the symptoms just, they kept on rolling. They kept on rolling, kept on going. And, you know, eventually uh, the light sensitivity and the sound sensitivity went away. But school got increasingly harder. I felt really dull. I don't know how to describe it, but it was like a really dull feeling. And um, I kept playing. That's probably the worst part of it all. I never never stopped. I kept going because I had that. You know, first of all, I was told I was okay, and I had that football player mentality of, you know, if I can walk and talk, then I'm okay to play football. Isaiah didn't recognize he suffered a concussion and never received treatment from doctors. He went on to suffer many of the common cognitive symptoms we'll cover today, including problems with his memory. For most people following a concussion, the memory symptoms last about seven days. Um, However, a significant minority, and it's around one in 10 or so, Uh, can have problems that last even longer than that. The important thing to note is that every single brain injury is different. And so the memory problems might not actually be just from the the memory impairment itself directly related to the concussion. You could have other concussion symptoms that can also cause you to have trouble with your memory and that might last longer than than the seven days. So you could have imagine problems with a pain in parts of your body that distract you and cause uh, a difficulty for you to remember things. You can have uh, problems with depression that have been shown to uh, ha- result in issues with people remembering things. And these different symptoms can either mimic memory problems or actually exacerbate those memory problems as well. Felt at that time, like I'm a totally different person. And that, that you know, that kind of ties in everything from the not being able to think straight, having a hard time processing, losing the memory, behavior, all that kind of starts to change. And I mean, it totally makes sense because your brain it's, it controls everything you do. You know what I mean? So you you injure it or damage it, it's going to change. It's going to change everything you do. It's going to change your thought, your ability to learn, your speech even. I had a hard time talking for a while. It, you know, it totally makes sense why it happens, but just to experience it, it's it's really rough. Just looking in the mirror and not really recognizing who you once were. After one of my concussions in 2003, for the first time in my life, I forgot my lines on live television. I mean, we may not share the same ethnic background. We may not share the same ethnic background, but if we may not share the same ethnic background, but you can trust me. What you hear there is me trying to jumpstart my brain and try to remember what my next line is by continuing to repeat the line that came before it. Eventually it clicked but it really crushed my confidence and I could not understand why this suddenly happened to me. When your brain is not functioning the way you're used to, like Isaiah said, it can be really difficult and demoralizing, but there are ways to feel better. For memory issues, Dr. Dan Shavar recommends a multi-step approach. 
when it comes to memory specifically, there's um, a really multimodal treatment plan that I'd, I'd initiate. Um, the, the first pillar of that treatment plan would involve things like cognitive rehabilitation, which are uh, exercises for memory that are often under the guidance of either a speech therapist or a physician or sometimes an occupational therapist as well. These can involve utilizing specific exercises or compensatory strategies uh, like writing in notebooks or using timers or alarms or messages, keeping task lists. There are also medications that are options, although though we, we, we tend to, I personally tend to uh, prefer the uh, non-pharmacologic uh, treatment modalities first because every medication has side effects associated with it. And that's something that you'd be able to definitely talk about with you, with your physician. And then uh, to round out the, the, the treatment, multimodal treatment plan, I'd want to address other factors that have been shown to uh, worsen memory. Uh, things like difficulty with sleep, um, other medications that you might be taking, pain medications or anticholinergic medications like Benadryl or something along those lines, uh, improving exercise, limiting uh, things like drugs or alcohol, uh, all of those uh, will help you on your path towards recovery. Another cognitive symptom of concussion is having difficulties with attention and concentration. Dr. Danchevar explains why those challenges may happen. As you look around wherever you are right now, take a look at all of the different things that you can see. Now, it's your brain's job to focus on the specific item in front of you that you're interested in and disregard the many other things that are in your visual field that you interact with every day that are distractions. And so when your brain's injured, you have a harder time tuning out those distractions and focusing on the things that you normally would be able to focus on. I, I couldn't read, first of all. <laughs> I totally forgot about that. Like, I, no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't read. I had a hard time following conversations. It's important to understand if you are someone with a pre-existing condition like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or if concentrating is difficult for you before a brain injury, the concussion may make things a lot worse. So in those individuals, it's even more important to get help early, to make sure that you're addressing the issue and that you're being proactive. If you have a concussion, things like stimulating environments where you might have a lot of distractions, the different psychosocial stressors that you might have in your life that could also increase the cognitive burden that you're under, and that would exacerbate any of the symptoms you're having as well. Whatever you can do to identify and minimize the triggers in your environment and any possible exacerbating factors will really help you in your concussion recovery. For individuals who are struggling with problems with attention, I'd recommend uh, the same strategies if they had prior problems with uh, attention or if they didn't. Uh, really, you want to set yourself up in a position to succeed when it comes with attention. Uh, that means uh, things like giving yourself more time while you're recovering to do tasks, uh, to schedule tasks that require a lot of attention and focus to the times of the day when you're at your best, when you're well rested, when you're refreshed, to try to limit sources of distraction when you're engaging in a task that requires a lot of attention um, and to focus on one task at a time instead of trying to multitask, even if it's something that you otherwise uh, would be able to, to do and to accomplish. Remember that you're in this recovery phase and your brain needs a little more time. That slowing down and taking one task at a time that Dr. Dan Shafar is talking about is easier said than done. It can be tempting to want to push through and challenge your brain to do all the tasks you're used to doing, but it's so important to slow down. Taking a few days or weeks to pull back on activities and take breaks will be worth it in the long run. Remember, this is not forever, and your brain just needs time to heal. Feeling like you're in a fog or feeling slowed down are just different manifestations of the same kinds of problems that you're having with, uh, that you might have with attention or with memory. Uh, and it's because your brain isn't functioning in the way that it normally would. Now, speech is actually a particularly interesting part of the, the brain and how it's processing, especially in relation with the concussion, because a speech involves a complex coordination between multiple different parts of the brain, from the frontal lobe to the temporal lobe to the parietal lobe, and the connections between there from the front, basically, to, to, towards the back of your brain. And when those connections are disrupted by the concussion, they're not able to communicate as well with one another. And so 
if you think of it as like a road that's been damaged, those are the those roads are the pathways between your cells. When those get damaged by the concussion, it takes time for them to heal and to recover back to normal. You might have an issue thinking of the word you're trying to think of and recalling it and then being able to speak it. All of those different parts of speaking are are controlled by different aspects of the brain, pulling up the word and being able to actually speak the word. And so if that pathway isn't disrupted, then your actual speech becomes impaired. Isaiah remembers how frightening it was struggling with his speech. Growing up, I, I always gave speeches like here and there, not like every single day, but um, I mean, even elementary school, I was, what was I? I was like treasurer of the school. So I got to go up and talk um, a few times throughout the year. High school, you know, when you get rewards or whatever, you get to go up and talk. And so I like, I've always enjoyed kind of speaking in front of people. And I always had the voice for it. My voice was deep. I spoke very clearly. And it's like, all of a sudden, I had a hard time finding words. It felt like at times I was talking with a sock in my mouth. That's how I describe it. Like your, your mouth just becomes mushy. And again, it doesn't make sense. None of this really makes sense, but you know, you're going through it. So, you know, to hit that point too, that was, that was pretty scary. And that's basically what it is. It feels like you're talking with a sock in your mouth. Certain words don't come out correctly. But you're saying one thing and something else comes out. Kind of that, you know, that working memory kind of ties into it too. You know, when you start to forget what you're even saying, now you're rambling, nothing really makes sense. You know, there's a point in time where I didn't even really, I didn't want to open my mouth sometimes because I was like, I don't, I don't know how this is going to come out. It's probably not going to come out right. And, you know, when that happens, people, again, they look at you like, what is wrong with you? And I'm thinking, man, I don't, I don't know what's wrong with me either, man. Like, it's just not, it's just not coming out. If you have problems with your speech or with language, it's important to uh, improve your self-monitoring and self-regulation. And that's part of what's taught in cognitive rehabilitation by speech therapists and by language therapists, because by better identifying the uh, types of settings that cause issues for you, and by better identifying the pathways that cause problems before you go on to them, you can better approach these problems in the real world. One thing I'll say to people is like, you know, nobody knows you the way you know you. You know, you're in your own body. You know when something's different, you know, whether it be speech, uh, whether it be your thoughts, whether it be, you know, you, you recognize when something's different before anybody else does. The most important thing to do with concussion recovery is to listen to yourself. And that's the best indicator of whether you're stressing your cognition too much. So if your symptoms start to get worse, if your headaches start to get worse, if you're struggling more with your memory or concentration or finding tasks increasingly frustrating, those are all indications that you might be pushing it a little too hard and an indication that you should start utilizing some of the compensatory strategies that I refer to in the multimodal treatment approach to concussion. And the important thing is you don't need to remember to do it on your own. It's important to make sure you have a, a coach in, on your side in the form of a clinician that's guiding you through the recovery process. Finding that person to guide you through your recovery process can be hard. You might not want to let your family or friends in on what you're going through, but Dr. Dan Shavar and Isaiah say reaching out and asking for support is key. One of the most frustrating aspects of these concuss concussions and concussive symptoms are that they're, in, they're so invisible and very isolating. The most important thing to do then is to seek help. The Concussion Legacy Foundation has a number of great resources for teaming up individuals with others that, that uh, have gone through these, these problems and that, uh, that can help. And then also to make sure that you utilize the resources that are available to you. So in schools, there's uh, alternate education plans that can help basically make sure that you're not overburdening your, your brain while it's recovering. And, and then of course, physicians and uh, therapists and other folks are all in your corner. Well, the very first thing that helped me, well, you know, first was reaching out to other people, finding out that there were other people going through this. And I mean, really that's just, you start to feel supported. 
because, you know, I look around in my immediate, you know, circle, nobody else was going through this in my immediate circle. So, you know, I, I felt very alone. You know, I, I isolated a lot of times and, you know, finally something told me to go on Facebook and see if there's a group or something out there. There's gotta be somebody out there on the internet talking about this. And I found some groups and, um, you know, that's, that was step one, just finding other people going through the same thing, people that understand what you're going through. Even, you know, some of it's hard to put in words, but they know exactly what you're talking about. And that definitely was an eye opener. And that was the start of me getting better. That connection with others who understand can be so comforting. We want to take a moment to speak directly to any caregivers who may be listening. We understand how hard it can be to see your loved ones slowed down, struggling to communicate, or having difficulty processing information as well as they used to be able to. If your loved one is experiencing any of the cognitive symptoms we've covered, Dr. Dan Shafar has some valuable advice. The important thing to remember as a caregiver is, again, that these symptoms are invisible and isolating. And as a result, the person who's injured can feel very alone. So as the caregiver, it's incredibly important then to make sure that you are reaching out and supporting that loved one. On top of that, it can often be difficult for even a person without a brain injury to navigate the healthcare environment to make sure that they're getting all the support they, they need. And that's also where a caregiver can come in because the caregiver can basically help identify the different clinicians and, and therapists and other folks that are all as part of a package able to help the concussed individual. CLF is here to help caregivers who may need assistance navigating the healthcare system for their loved one after concussion. If you're looking for doctor recommendations, treatment suggestions, or peer support, reach out to our team at the CLF Helpline. We provide personalized one-on-one -on -one support and would be glad to help you and your loved one through the recovery process. Submit a request at concussionfoundation.org slash helpline today, and a member of our staff will be in touch. Now, back to the episode. If you're experiencing cognitive symptoms after concussion, it's easy to feel insecure if you can't perform at school or work like you used to. We want you to know that it's normal to be feeling that way. I was definitely getting headaches like pretty much every single day. And then, yeah, it was just like, I'm not smart anymore. <laughs> it's like, you know, I, I've always considered myself someone who could, you know, I was pretty intelligent. I was um, self-learning a lot of things in and outside of school and then all of a sudden it was like that that went out the door you could show me a million times it just wouldn't click in my head you know what you're trying to teach me and you know at that point I, I did kind of like start to lose interest in school I guess you can say and I became more concerned with just making sure my grade was up whatever it took but not really learning the information because that was just way too much it just became impossible at a point you know so it's 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 hard to explain like you hear it but it doesn't it doesn't settle in your head that information that you're being taught it's like going in one ear and out the other basically after you have a concussion it can be incredibly jarring to your confidence to who you feel like you are as a person when you're not thinking the way you normally do when you're not able to do the kinds of things you normally do it can be be scary but the important thing to remember again is that people get better after their injuries, that if you get the proper treatment and the proper training with your doctors and your therapists, you'll get better as well. And you'll come back, go back to your normal thinking and memory and behavior. Along with finding support, Isaiah found healing by changing his habits. I've definitely, you know, changed the things I do as far as, you know, eating even, you know, what I drink. Everything I do now is, is for my head. So I'm thinking about that, I, you know, I, I cut out alcohol pretty much 100% because I, I don't want to potentially mess myself up that way. I, you know, I'm sticking with the CBD. I'm pretty much just lifestyle, you know, it, it, everything, you know, making sure I go to bed on time, not staying up all night, you know, making sure I wake up in the morning, not kind of laying in, getting, you know, one thing they focus on is getting blue light. So I make sure, you know, I step outside for a few minutes and just wake myself up. You know, it's, like, it's really, it's a lot of the stuff that I wasn't capable of doing for a long time. The most important thing to remember is that while, although while you're recovering, things can seem bleak, 
and things can seem very isolating, people get better after concussions. So you really have to trust the recovery process, make sure you have clinical guidance and that you're getting the care you need, but you, you will get better as long as you're properly treated. Like you might be feeling this way now, but it, it could get better and it will get better. I was in a place where I didn't think it was gonna get better. I thought I was stuck. You know, I'm doing all these searches, like what, what can help? Everything I'm finding is like, oh yeah, there's pretty much nothing you can do. At this point, you're pretty much stuck like that. So I, I thought this was my new life forever, you know? I didn't think there was anything out there that would help. I thought this was just it. So definitely know that that's not the case because I, I was rock bottom. I was in a horrible place. I never saw myself coming back, you know, and here I am. So I'm very thankful to be here today and be able to tell my story. Amazing. I can't tell you how happy it makes me feel to hear inspirational messages like Isaiah's. Thank you so much to Isaiah and Dr. Danchevar for joining us for today's episode of Concussion Game Plan. If you have any questions about what you heard today or are looking for more information on concussion or post-concussion syndrome or want to get involved with our work, please visit our website at concussionfoundation.org. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a five-star rating and review. Your review helps more people find us in their recovery journeys. Feeling better is one thing, but feeling totally ready to return to school or work after concussion is another. Coming up in episode six, we'll explore strategies, tips, and guidance to navigate the return to school and return to work process. Until then, I'm Dr. Chris Nowinski. Keep fighting.